You might have heard something about Evergrande Group recently. This is a sprawling company with billions of dollars in debt, a little bit of a cash crunch, and is looking for a way out. Who knows what is going to happen? Everything is all up in the air, and we are hearing new things each day. But the whole saga has gotten me interested in how a real estate company has managed to grow so far and so fast. That is what we will talk about today. In this video, we look at the rise and fall of what had once been China's biggest real estate conglomerate, a company now with $300 billion in liabilities. But first, I want to talk for a few moments about the Asianometry Patreon. If you like what this channel does, you can support the work by joining the Early Access tier. Early Access members get to see new videos before they are released to the public. There is also a general support tier, and signing up for that would be amazing too. So head on over to the Patreon page and take a look. I deeply appreciate anything you'd be able to sign up for. Thank you, and on with the show. Evergrande's founder, and until recently chairman, is Shu Jiaying. He was born in 1958, the son of a farmer and veteran in the Second Sino-Japanese War. His mother died of sepsis when he was just eight months old, due to the fact that his family had no money to seek medical treatment for her. In 1974, at the age of 16, Shu graduated from high school. The college entrance exams at the time were closed, so he set up his first business, selling building materials on the street. He then worked a series of rural jobs, cement factory worker, village security officer, and tractor driver. In 1978, he took the Gaokao on his second try and ranked third out of 10 million students in the city of Zhoukou City. This granted him entrance into the Wuhan University of Science and Technology, where he graduated with honors. Soon after graduation, he met and married his wife, Yang Huiying, a woman of similar impoverished background. From there, he worked at the Henan Wuyang Iron and Steel Company as an assistant director of the heat treatment workshop of the company's steel rolling plant. He was responsible for over 300 employees. While he managed with an iron fist, he paid attention to his workers' welfare. The workshop's high performance raised his overall profile. After 10 years working for the company, Seven has a director, Shu left after being investigated for selling scrap metal in his downtime. He says he was doing it to clear out the floor and earn more money for his workers. I guess I'll believe him. Sure, why not? He then joined a trading company. Shenzhen Zhongda Group, as a salesperson, but quickly rising to office director. By now, it is pretty obvious that Shu is a go-getter, making an immediate impact. He shepherded a steel trading alliance with his former company Wuyang Iron and Steel. He implemented a double salary system, where his top workers get a bonus totaling an entire year's salary. And then in 1994, he pushed for Zhongda to enter the real estate market. With company blessing, he set out to Guangzhou, bringing with him four workers, a driver, cashier, salesman, and handyman. This all sounds like the start of a profane joke. There they developed a real estate project called Zhu Dao Garden, literally meaning Pearl Island Garden. They rented fancy hotel rooms to strike deals and posted adverts to attract customers. The company implemented a low cost, high value design that stood out in the market, a key differentiation from the massive luxury units being made at the time. For the first time, premium real estate was accessible to the middle class. By mid-1997, just two years after first entering the real estate business, Pearl Island Garden made Zhongda a profit of $31 million. Yet despite this, Shu still drew a salary of just $450 a month over five times what a civil servant would draw, for sure, but still far from the value he brought to the company. He asked his boss, Zhong Da's CEO, for a raise, but was rejected. Thus, Shu left to start his own thing. He was then around 39 years old. In 1997, Shu started Evergrande Industrial Group in Guangzhou, a real estate company. The Chinese name, like the English one, means something that is, quote, endless from the past into the present, end quote. With just eight employees, Xu scoured Guangzhou for a prime piece of land to develop. 
he found himself in competition with China's major real estate developers, Banqi, Dalian Wanda, and Country Garden. They were more established, with more money and resources to acquire prime pieces of land. Shu persevered. His first project would be a place called Jinbi Garden, built on the site of an old pesticide plant on Industrial Avenue in the Hanzhou district. The 110,000 square meter plot, as you might guess, had issues. Too many factories, a lack of urban infrastructure, and a serious pollution problem. But for these same reasons, Shu would be able to acquire the plot at an extremely low price. Even then, however, Evergrande could not afford the required 5 million RMB down payment. But the company did convince the government to allow them to purchase the lot in installments. Thus began Evergrande's lifelong addiction. They went to a bank and borrowed. They borrowed 6 million RMB. Five of that went to the first installment, the down payment. The last million would be used to kick off construction. Jin B Garden broke ground in June 1997. Two months later, in August 1997, the first round of housing sales opened up to the public. The company sold each unit at 2,800 RMB per square meter, or about $40 USD per square foot. This was below cost. It was a sales sensation, selling out in just two hours. People lined up day and night to buy a house, like as if it were an Apple product. The company made 80 million RMB, or 12 million USD, in sales, giving it their first bucket of gold, as they would like to say in Chinese. Evergrande did not waste time. Almost immediately, they began development on 13 other plants in Guangzhou simultaneously. By 1999, just two years after founding, Evergrande was Guangzhou's seventh largest real estate company. They then rapidly expanded refining their internal procedures and business model. Then in 2006, they began their national expansion, deploying 200 employees into Wuhan, Shenyang, Chongqing, and Chengdu. The goal was to recreate 20 Evergrands in just three years. At this time, the company's balance sheet showed that it had 7.8 billion RMB, or 1.2 billion USD in total assets. Of that, it had 6.8 billion RMB, or 1 billion USD in debt. With Jinbi Garden and virtually everything else thereafter, Shu implemented the same business strategy as his first project all the way back at Pearl Island Garden. Small units in previously foul areas, price targeted to the middle class, and built extremely quickly. They build the development in rounds. First, they sell a lot of debt to raise funds for purchasing land development rights in certain areas. They then build and sell as many units to get back their initial investment. They might pay back some debt, but most sales from each round is then plowed back into more land lot purchases and more development. Evergrande's early strategy during these high growth years can be summarized in the slogan San Gao Yi Di, which literally means three highs, one low. The three highs are high debt, high leverage, and high turnover. The one low is low cost. The high debt is precarious, and it means that Evergrande will always be teetering on a razor's edge. But without that debt, the company cannot acquire its massive land bank. And land was the country's fastest appreciating asset at the time. So for the most part, the company stayed ahead of its debt costs so long as land prices kept rising. It is important to note here that when I say liabilities, I mean a lot more than just obligations in the form of borrowings, like bonds. A significant portion comes in the form of deposits from customers, down payments for future homes. The sheer amount of liabilities can be misleading. For instance, JP Morgan Chase, America's biggest bank, has something like $3.1 trillion in liabilities. Internet financial geniuses like to bring up this number in internet forums to scare people. The difference between JP Morgan and Evergrande, however, have to do with the nature of those liabilities and when they can be withdrawn. For JP Morgan Chase, $2.1 trillion of that $3 trillion are in the form of customer bank deposits. They are technically owed to its customers who can withdraw them at any time. 
but most likely that 2.1 trillion will sit in those people's checking accounts, which furthermore are backed by the FDIC. Evergrande, however, is not a bank, and customer deposits for future homes are not the same as checking accounts. The risk of a forced withdrawal is much higher. Furthermore, much of what Evergrande owes, over 50%, is classified as current, meaning that it might be called upon to be repaid within a year or an operating cycle. JP Morgan Chase, to finish off the metaphor, only has $45 billion of current liabilities against this $3.3 trillion in assets. So one big risk, not the only one, mind you, is that Evergrande comes across a period of time when it needs to cough up cash to pay its current liabilities, like, you know, a financial crisis or something. No biggie. The 2008 global financial crisis kicked off fears of a real estate crisis in China. Evergrande found itself in rather turbulent waters. At this period of time, the company was in the midst of its national expansion. They were spending lots of money to acquire valuable plots of land in China's first and second tier cities. Its land bank had grown nine times over since 2006. But with something like 37 projects in the hopper at the time, the company was, surprise, having trouble coming up with cash flow. Evergrande at this time owed about 12 to 15 billion RMB, a mere 2 billion USD. Evergrande's original plan to pay off this mountain of debt was to take the company public in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. But the global financial crisis nixed this, and Xu scrambled to find the money to pay off the company's debt. Xu reached out to his friends. His first choice, Wang Shi of Van Ke, turned him down. Desperate, Xu then turned to Chang Yudong of Chao Tai Fook Group, one of Hong Kong's richest business families. The two had dinner and played cards for three months. Shu does not speak Cantonese, and Chung did not understand Mandarin, a familiar situation in many an Asian American family gathering. Going off my own personal experiences, I reckon they use hand gestures in between long, awkward pauses. Anyway, in the end, Uncle Chung decided to invest over 150 million USD as a lead investor in a pre-IPO 500 million USD investment round to help bail out Evergrande. Other investors include Deutsche Bank, Bank of America at Merrill Lynch, and the Kuwait Investment Authority. It allowed the company to stabilize its business and continue its projects. November 2009, the IPO went ahead in Hong Kong as planned, and the shares rose 34% on the first day. Xu held a 68% stake in Evergrande at the time. At the company's 70 billion Hong Kong dollar or 10 billion USD valuation, that pegged as well that over 6 billion USD. At the end of 2009, Evergrande had total assets in the amount of 63 billion RMB or 9.8 billion USD. Total liabilities of 50 billion RMB or 7.8 billion USD. Razor's Edge. But it was clear that Xu wanted to build an empire. A year after the IPO, Evergrande spent 100 million RMB or 15 million USD to acquire the Guangzhou Football, or Soccer, Club a member of the Chinese Super League. Evergrande stabilized the club's previously rocky ownership situation and brought it great success. They won seven straight Chinese Super League championships. Then, in 2013, the club won the Asian Champions League title, the first Chinese team to do so in 23 years. During the event, Evergrande formally began its move into the consumer goods industry with its mineral water product. Marketing claimed that Evergrande being Chen literally meaning Evergrande Ice Spring, came from the deep mineral springs of Changbai Mountain. Known in Korea as Baktu Mountain, this sacred mountain straddles the Chinese and North Korean borders. I'm not sure how true this marketing claim actually is, but the bottling plant is based in the city closest to the mountain, so maybe? I don't know if you know this, but this mountain is very special to the Koreans. I did a video about it a few years ago, about the history of negotiations between the Chinese and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, colloquially known as North Korea. Anyway, my point in saying this, other than to plug my video, is that this is high-end water. It's kind of like selling water from Denali in the United States. Xu set optimistic targets for Ice Spring. He announced that he targeted 10 billion RMB or 1.5 billion USD in sales in 2014, a year after launch. 
By 2016, they would be selling three times that, 30 billion RMB or 4.6 billion USD. This was ambitious. The brand struggled. Evergrande attempted to take the business public, but outsiders questioned its viability. While gross margins were high, the brand was not making profit. Eventually in 2016, Evergrande sold its shares in the mineral water business along with a variety of other food products that came along with it. The sale brought in about 2.7 billion RMB or 405 million and included the unit's 3.3 billion RMB or 510 million USD in debt. I would consider that an absolute win, I guess. In mid-2014, Shu unveiled a new strategy of diversity plus scale plus brand. The goal would be to diversify the company's operations out of real estate. It felt like they were trying to put a strategic spin on something they were randomly doing here and there. To illustrate, three months after the announcement, Evergrande acquired Yuan Chen Plastic Surgery, a chain of plastic surgery clinics. Shu's wife, Yang Huiying, was placed in charge of its operations. Other purchases would follow. In early 2017, Shu got up in front of his company employees and told them that he was changing up the way Evergrande did business. At this time, the company had total liabilities of 1.15 trillion RMB or 178 billion USD. About the same has the total liabilities of Connecticut and Massachusetts put together. I think. Who knows for sure with the way they do state accounting nowadays. As I previously mentioned, the company's previous strategy was three highs, one low. High debt, high leverage, high turnover, low cost. This time, Shu announced that he would be replacing that strategy with a new one. Basically, a 180-degree reversal. San Di Yi Gao, or three lows, one high. Low debt, low leverage, low cost, and high turnover. The goal was for the company to lower its debt ratios and raise its total net assets. This change is in line with recent pronouncements by the Chinese government about delevering the economy. It also demonstrates something I have noticed about Evergrande. Shu, or whoever he works with, has pretty close ties to the government. He is likely China's single most generous individual in terms of charity. He won the China Charity Award for eight years in a row, contributing more cash to charity than anyone else. In each of the years 2018 and 2019, he is estimated to have donated 4 billion RMB or 620 million USD in cash. Each year, mind you. That money goes somewhere, and it buys you a lot of friends. And like with another famous business mogul, Zhao Weiguo of Qinghua Unigroup, he is not afraid to leverage those ties to sail the winds of trade or fight vicious battles against those who attack him. For instance, in June 2012, Andrew Left of American short-selling firm Citroen Research published a report on Evergrande, claiming that the company was insolvent. Not a fraud, insolvent. The Hong Kong authorities launched a years-long civil case against him. In 2016, they banned him from trading in Hong Kong for five years. Then, in 2019, Left lost his last appeal. In 2021, Left said in an interview that he did not know that Shu was so powerful at the time. I didn't know any of this. I would have never gotten into it, he said. They must have put him through the ringer. The 2017 strategy turnaround kicked off a variety of debt reduction measures. The company sold a bunch of assets, raised investment funds, and paid down a bunch of debt. At the end of the year, the company crowed about net profits rising 110% to 37 billion RMB, or 5.7 billion USD. Some news reports also crowed that the net debt ratio declined. But I took a look into the annual report and total liabilities actually rose from 1.1 trillion RMB or 170 billion USD in 2016 to 1.5 trillion RMB or 232 billion USD. Total borrowings went from 532 billion RMB or 82 billion USD to 113 billion USD. So I am not sure what is the basis for this claim. And anyway, the key point is that Evergrande felt that it had sufficiently demonstrated to investors that it could turn a profit. Now it was China's most profitable real estate company. It made the Fortune 500 ranking for the first time, and so on. The whole thing reminds me of Amazon. From 2000 to 2005, the company turned a minimal profit. Not exactly losses, but very small in relation to its valuation. 
Bull said that the company was investing in the future, but people had started to doubt if the company could ever deliver on its potential. Then in 2008, the company began to show rising profits for a few years, topping out at over a billion in net income in 2010. It demonstrated to everyone that Amazon could indeed make money and they were just investing for the future. I think that was what Evergrande was trying to do here, get itself to a spot where it can tell everyone, told you so. But the diet did not last long. Shu had smelled another change in the wind. In 2018, the United States effectively crippled the Chinese telecommunications company ZTE with technology export sanctions. The event demonstrated the Chinese industry's over-dependence on American technologies, and the Chinese government decided to reshuffle its priorities. The political winds have redirected and Shu was there to take advantage. In 2018, he announced that he would have Evergrande enter the high-tech industry. Quantum computing, AI, life sciences, and of course, new energy vehicles. He attempted to acquire the American EV company Faraday Future, but after that fell through, he decided that Evergrande would go it alone. In November 2019, Evergrande announced that they would invest 45 billion RMB, or 7 billion USD, over the next three years to develop electric vehicles. The company did not opt to found a brand new subsidiary for this effort. Instead, they used a Hong Kong listed health company that they already owned, Evergrande Health Industry Group Limited, and then renamed it to Evergrande Auto. That company, in turn, had once been a Hong Kong listed company called New Media Group. That company published weekly gossip magazines and the like. Evergrande bought them, merged them with some hospital chains, and Evergrande Yuanchen Medical Beauty Hospital the chain of plastic surgery clinics that I mentioned earlier, to create this Frankenstein's monster. The company still operates those hospitals and medical clinics, but now they also are going to try to compete with Tesla and the like in the EVs. Okay. In August 2020, Evergrande Auto unveiled six vehicles under its Hangqi brand, sedans, SUVs, and multi-purpose vehicles. In the announcement, the company said that the first model would hit the market a year later which seems to me a little ambitious. A month later, the company raised 500 million USD in investment money from Tencent, ride-hailing company Didi, Sequoia Capital, and Jack Ma's personal investment fund, Yunfen Capital. Evergrande Auto struck two more very big deals, one with Guanghui Group, the country's biggest automobile dealer, to establish a sales network for selling Hangqi vehicles. The second deal was with one of China's state-owned power giants, State Grid Corporation of China to set up a bunch of charging stations nationwide. The Hong Kong stock surged on the back of these news items as well as general stock market EV euphoria. In April 2021, the auto subsidiary was valued at nearly $90 billion, more than American automaker Ford Motors at the time. This was obviously a bubble. In 2020, Ford sold 4.2 million vehicles and made $127 billion in revenue. Evergrande Auto, on the other hand, had not yet even sold one car and was losing billions of RMB each year in the business. They made more from plastic surgery than EVs. They also plowed a bunch of money into production facilities with three bases in Shanghai, Tianjin, and Guangzhou. Why three? Even as it was happening, people in the industry thought it was all quote-unquote weird. Eventually, people returned to their senses and the stock crashed back down by over 95% as part of the group's larger woes. This is the perfect time to talk about the red lines. The Chinese state financial centers have long talked about the possible contagion threats in its financial sector. Over the past few years, ill-advised policy and low interest rates have created massive Chinese conglomerates. Companies like Foson Group, Anbang Insurance Group, and of course, Evergrande. Now, there is nothing financially dangerous about a big company in of itself. Socially, maybe, but financially, not really. Take the Zaibatsu of Japan's past, for instance. Massive conglomerates, but their acquisitions and businesses were sustainably funded entirely from their own savings. But these Chinese mini-empires were funded on the back of borrowed money. Not just loans and bonds that appear on the balance sheet, but also secret guarantees and arrangements that do not appear in the financial statements. These off-balance sheet situations are a major problem. The Chinese government decided that it needed to do something about this. After interviews with 12 real estate companies, two ministries in August 2020 passed regulations mandating something it called the three red lines. 
1. A percentage ceiling on the ratio of liabilities to assets of 70%, accepting advances from contracted projects. 2. A cap on the percentage of net debt to equity, 100%. And 3. A requirement to hold at least $1 of cash for each dollar borrowed in the short term. Any real estate company that did not fulfill these requirements would not be allowed to add more debt to their books. This is not unprecedented behavior, but the punishment could be pretty severe for a company so reliant on growing its way out of bad times. Evergrande's metrics for these red lines at the time when the law was passed. Liabilities to asset ratio, 82%. Bad. Percentage of net debt to equity, 199%. Very bad. Ratio of cash to short-term borrowings, 0.4. Oh my. Evergrande wasn't just touching the red lines. It took them to prom and got them pregnant in the back seat of a Volkswagen Beetle. Schur's very well plugged into the political system, but this seems to have caught him and the company off guard. After a few weeks, he called an internal meeting where he announced that Evergrande would slash pricing on its 600-ish new builds nationwide by 30% with the goal of achieving sales of 100 billion RMB or 15.4 billion USD each month. Now, the company is not unfamiliar with such discounts. In March 2020, during the depths of the pandemic crisis, the company discounted its nationwide real estate units by 78%. But it is a bad look for everyone involved. Anyway, we need to talk about the letter. In September 2020, a Chinese website leaked a letter sent by Evergrande to the Guangdong provincial government. The letter is titled, Report on Requesting Support for Major Asset Restructuring Projects. Some news sources confirm the letter's authenticity, but the company itself says it is a fake. I reckon it is real and the market agrees with me, but you can decide for yourself. The letter starts by re-emphasizing Evergrande's adherence to the central government's real estate price reduction policies and reform. It also goes over a brief timeline of events, the kind of stuff you need to say before a big ask. The letter then casually says that the company's interest-bearing liabilities have reached about 835 billion RMB or 130 billion USD. 232 billion RMB or 35.8 billion USD owed to 128 domestic banks. The two biggest banks on this list are Mingshang Bank, China's first private bank, and Agricultural Bank of China, one of China's big four banks. 368 billion RMB or 56.9 billion USD owed to 121 non-banking entities, real estate funds and the like it seems. The rest owed to various domestic and offshore bonds. The report requests the Guangdong government's help in coordinating a reorganization of Evergrande's various entities. The intricacies of that are not worth discussing here. But the key point is that if the reorganization is not completed before February 2021, then Evergrande needs to pay various strategic investors 130 billion RMB or 20 billion USD and 13.7 billion RMB or 2.2 billion USD in dividends. This could trigger a sudden cash flow crunch and place the company's financial health at risk. Since then, it's been a flurry of various news items, debt downgrades and the like. Shares have dropped over 68% and the debt has lost over half of its value. The company is trying to find someone to give them money. Everyone is wondering if the government will bail them out. The usual. Evergrande's 2020 annual report says that the company has about 1.95 trillion RMB or about 300 billion USD in liabilities. You can reduce these liabilities with asset sales. And Evergrande does have a whole lot of assets. 1.9 trillion RMB worth of them on the balance sheet. The problem is that much of these assets are in the form of land bank assets or houses under construction. And they are not really worth much unless the vendors and construction crews are paid. So right now, Evergrande is in a bit of a bind here. There are other concerns too. I read about obligations for Evergrande Wealth Management Fund products. These are high yielding interest products, 70 to 80% of which are first sold to employees, who then resell them to their friends and family. Taishin notes that there are about 40 billion RMB or 6.2 billion USD of this stuff out there. In September 8, 2021, two of the company's affiliates missed repayments on these obligations, causing angry folks to come protest at Evergrande's headquarters, 
screaming stuff like, Shu Jiayin, return my hard-earned money. This is pretty bad. If there is one thing in China that really pisses off the government, that is to cause social unrest. Five days later, Evergrande announced repayment of these products through a variety of ways. Cash, if you wait. Payment in kind, as in you get a literal chunk of land, or credit for a future payment of a house. It goes some ways, but of course many investors are still unhappy. 6 billion USD is a lot of money, and I don't really see it on the main group's balance sheet. And that goes to the off-balance sheet issue. Evergrande Group has a variety of subsidiaries that stay off the main group's books because the group does not own 51% of their stock. But they still represent themselves as an Evergrande company, and their debts are backed by the main group through an unspoken agreement. We don't know how much more of that is out there. Enron had this same issue. With all this turmoil in the media and the financial markets, Xu Jiaying resigned as Evergrande's chairman on August 17, 2021. Zhao Changlong stepped up as chairman, general manager, and legal representative, the man who holds the seal. And it is here where we will end this. Like I said at the start of the video, the Evergrande situation is an ongoing event, and the story is not over yet. More will come out in the future. If it does, then I'll do a newsletter update. For what it is worth, I do not think the government is going to bail this company out. Evergrande is no bank. The company will go to court for debt resolution, and be slowly broken up like any other. As many others have pointed out, there are concerns about the effect Evergrande's winding down will have on its hundreds of new builds and their real estate markets across the Chinese nation. But I guess lower real estate prices would be in line with the government's overarching social equality goals, right? They will get what they wish for. And on an absolute level, non-performing real estate loans remain low across the overall financial system. There's capacity to absorb losses here. The bigger question with regards to the off-balance sheet stuff is whether or not state regulators can fence off the damage before it causes a systemic crisis of confidence. They probably can. The regulators have before handled other massive conglomerates in crisis. Anbang Insurance, for instance, comes to mind. And finally, I wonder if Xu will face charges for annoying the government with this whole kerfuffle. Tsinghua Unigroup's Zhao Weiguo, a similar situation, hasn't yet, as of this writing, but Wu Xiaohui of Anbang Insurance has. Guess we will find out in the days to come, so keep your eyes peeled. Alright, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing. I would like to reach 100,000 subscribers someday, and you will get to watch a lot of other videos on this channel that fit your interest. Want to send me an email? Drop me a line at john at asianometry.com. I love reading your emails. Introduce yourself, suggest a topic, or more. Until next time, I'll see you guys later.